And if people don't meet standards, then you have to counsel them and you have to, there has to be consequences for not meeting standards. But here's the difference. Here's the difference between a boss who leads by fear and a leader who leads by example. A boss, if, if you're not meeting the standards, I walk up to you, hey, Michelle, you're not meeting the standards, fix it and walk away. Or this is going to happen. And then you walk away. A leader says, Michelle, you're not meeting the standards. Here's the standard. This is what you're doing. Welcome to the Business Ownership Podcast, brought to you by Awareness Strategies, helping you navigate the waters between entrepreneurship and ownership. Hey there, peeps. This is Michelle Nedelec, and I'm super glad that you're here with us today because I'm here with my most amazing guest, Oakland. Oakland, thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to it. Awesome. So give everyone the highlight of who you are and what you do for business. Yeah, so right now, well, I, I did 23 years in the Army as an Army officer in the United States Army and a combat arms officer. And then when I retired from the Army, I ran a food bank, the day-to-day -day operations of a food bank for, for about 18 months. So you don't get any different than that, a combat arms <laughs> officer running a food bank. And then, uh, and then they offered me to come here to Daytona Beach and be a recruiter for the Army ROTC program here. So I'm helping to produce the next generation of leaders for the army and the nation. And, uh, and about two years ago, uh, I wrote my first book and I've been out on the speaking circuit going around talking, um, uh, to different organizations, a wide variety of organizations. And, uh, on the 29th of September this year, I'm going to retire from my day job and I'm going to write my second book and just concentrate on getting out and talking. I love it. So what's your first book about? Let's start there. Yeah. So the first book is titled Your Leadership Legacy. It's about leadership. And the thing I always tell people about that book is there is no mention whatsoever of theory in my book. It's everyday things that everyday leaders can do to improve their skills and their ability and their people and their organization. Mm -hmm. um, so it and it's kind of my philosophy. It's written in servant leadership, because that's my philosophy of leadership. Love it. So I, I'm going to venture to say, I probably know your answer, but I want your words. How did you get into leadership as a thing? Well, you know, I, I was a leader all my life. Basically, I was a leader of my sports teams. I played baseball, basketball, football in high school. I, I was student of president of my student government, president of my class. So I kind of liked being a leader. I, I liked doing those things. And a couple of my mentors in high school were servant leaders. So they kind of pointed me in that direction. And uh, about sophomore year in high school, I decided, you know, I like this and I think I want to do it in the army. And so uh, I went through the officer training and uh, in college and loved every minute of it. That's awesome. So talk to me about this idea of servant leadership. What, do you, what does that mean to you? And what are the kind of semantics behind it? Yes. So I, I'm I'm a firm believer that, and when I talk, I talk about this, but it's not about you and it's all about you. And people always say, well, Colonel McCullough, how can it be all, not about me and all about me? And I always tell them, look, it's not about you in the title you get or the privileges you get or the better pay you get. And let's face it, leaders usually get those kinds of things. But if that's the only reason you want to be a leader, go do something else, please, because nobody <laughs> wants to follow you. It's all about you and how you treat people and how you run your organization. Because let's face it, leadership is about pe people, plain mm -hmm. and simple. And if you can lead people, you can lead any organization. And I prove that 23 years in the Army, food bank. Now I'm a government service officer leading things. It, it doesn't matter. As long as you can lead people, understand that it's about people, you can lead any organization. Nice. So I know there's some people that really like the idea of leadership, but they're really bad at it. What are yeah. some of the things you've noticed about things that, you know, it's, it's admirable that they've attempted, but it's like, yeah, would, you're falling short here, there, and everywhere. The, the, what, are the those, two things, what are some of those areas? <laughs> yeah, the two two main areas that I see when I when I consider somebody not a good leader, number one is that they don't set the example. For the people that they're leading. And I always tell people, good good leaders always do the right thing. At least they try to. And if you fall short, then you admit you made a mistake and you move on. You, you fix it, you move on. And as long as you do that, then that trust is there, still there with the people that you, you're leading. And without trust, the lead-led 
uh, the leader led relationship falls apart. So the first thing I see is people don't set the example that they, they don't meet their own standards that they're holding everybody else to. And the second thing I see the biggest mistake is micromanaging. Uh, and, and we've all worked for that person, right? <laughs> um, and nobody likes to work for that person. It, it's horrible. And I had a boss one time who taught me early on. He said, Oak, leadership is on a scale. On this side of the scale, you've got micromanaging, authoritarian, do what I tell you to do type of leader that nobody likes to work for. And on this side of the scale, you have chaos and Attila the Hunt. He said, and you want to be as close to chaos as you feel comfortable. And he said, the way you get there is that you train the people to the standards you expect them to meet. You give them the resources that they need to get the job done that you're assigning them. And then you give them the authority to do the job. You, you, know, you can never give away responsibility, but you can give away all the authority you want. And then you get out of their way. He said, the closer you get to chaos, the more creativity you're allowing, because you're allowing that person to use their skills, their knowledge, their abilities to get the job done. I love that. So talk to me about the difference between kind of a new leader and an experienced leader versus a new team and an experienced team. Because oftentimes we'll trade off one for the other and it's not necessarily <laughs> parallel or, you know, yeah, I, well, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna have that situation, mm -hmm. I think the best situation is you have an experienced, well running team with a young leader. Then they can help teach him or mm -hmm. her the the ropes how to be a good leader. And and I ran into that. I took over a platoon when I was a brand new lieutenant, and my platoon sergeant still remember him today, Sergeant First Class Pinson. I took over that day, he grabbed me by the shoulder, said, come on over here, sir, let's, let's have lunch. And he said, look, you're the leader, you're in charge, you're responsible, we'll do things any, the way, any way you want to do them. He said, but I've been, I was 24 years old, by the way. He said, I have been in the Army for 23 years. He'd been in the Army almost as long as I've been alive. <laughs> and he says, if you're going to mess up, I'm going to tell you. If you still want to do it that way, it's your platoon. We'll do it however you want to do it. But it's my job to help guide you in the right direction. And I paid attention to Sergeant Benson. A couple of times I came up with something and I, I said to him, this is what I want to do. And he looked at me and said, really? I said, well, maybe not. <laughs> but, but I think new leaders, I think one of the things that we have to remember is that it's Today's leaders who have the responsibility to coach and train and mentor and develop those junior leaders. And you got to take that seriously. It doesn't just happen. They don't just become great leaders on their own. They, they get that way by the coaching, mentoring, training, by getting out there and leading and making mistakes and learning from mistakes. And like I said, you can you can have a mentor who works for you. It doesn't have to be somebody you work for. So I think that's the key is that we got to understand that the leaders today have to ha have a responsibility to develop the next generation of leaders. Nice. I love this conversation. So I'm going to delve into it a little bit and then we can take it where you want in a bit. But I want to talk about younger leaders taking leadership over more senior position people, because I think it's going to become more prominent, especially in the age of technology. These kids were born with gadgets, widgets, and gadgets in their hands. Yeah. And we're still looking at them like, really, do I have to figure out the internet? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think they're going to naturally go to rise to leadership positions, but not necessarily have the breadth and width of our experience. Um, and I value both. But how, how does somebody navigate those waters? Yeah, so I think, number one, you have to listen to the people who have the experience. Um, if you're the young leader, if you're the if you're the person who's older than than the person leading you, then then it again, it's your responsibility. Take it, look at it this way. It's your job to help develop that person into the leader that you want to follow. And that's what I tell all the NCOs, the non-commissioned officers that that I work with. I said, look, when you get a brand new lieutenant, a brand new leader, a brand new whatever in whatever profession, it doesn't matter. Part of your job is to help develop them. So I think that's number one is, is you got to understand that it's going to happen sometimes. And in some professions, it happens all the time, like in the army, all the time, the second lieutenant, the brand new leader is always younger than, than the, so most of the soldiers 
he or she is leading. I think the other thing that we have to keep in mind, if you're the young leader, is number one, you have to listen to, to those experienced people. And number two is you just, you have to really develop that trust. They want to trust you, but you have to give them, you have to show them that they can trust you. And I always, you know, because again, it's about people. And one, one of the things I always tell young leaders is a cu couple things to help develop that for us. Number one, every day, go out and find one person in your organization and find out something new about that person. Not about work, something personal. Now, I know you got to keep the led leader, you know, the leader led relationship uh, kind of in there. But that doesn't mean you can't find out information about them. Find out what their what their spouse's name is, how many kids they have, what sports do they play, what hobbies do, does the family have? Something new about one person every day. And I tell them the way to do that, which is the second part of building trust, is you don't lead from sitting behind a desk. Now, I got it. Leaders have to be behind a desk sometimes because you got to fill out paperwork and do all that stuff that no leader like, no real leader likes to do, but you got to do it. But every chance you get, you need to be out there where the people that you are leading are. And I had a boss one time who retired a three-star general and he said, Oak, never, ever turn down a chance to go get your own cup of coffee. He said, two things happen when you do that. Number one, you show everybody that's working for you that you're human. You have to get your own cup of coffee just like they do. Nobody's bringing it to you. And number two, if you're lucky, you got two or three different ways to get to the coffee pot and back to your office. And along the way, you stop and talk to people. Because here's the thing. If, you, if, I, if I'm your leader and I call you in my office and ask you a question, I'm not going to get the straight answer. Because now you're in, it's in, intimidating. You're in the boss's office. If I go out to your, where you're working and I ask you a question, you're going to tell me the right answer. I, I believe that it, it's happened to me. So I know it happens. Um, so get out of, from your office, go out there and learn the people, learn about the people you have the privilege to lead. And it is a privilege. And, and you'll see that trust just explode. Nice. I love that. I once heard that explained as if they're on the other side of the fence and they're explaining something to you, only what's between the, the parts of the fence can come through. The rest of it got stuck on their side of the fence. So you got to go into their pen to figure out what's going on. You can't expect them to go into yours. Absolutely. Um, it just gave me a good visual for it. And I'm, it's stuck with me ever since. So there are some people that will typically rise into leadership level just because of something. And those that will maybe stay for the rest of their lives in a ser service position. What do you think are the attributes to those? And why does that tend to happen? I think one, because we don't do a good job of developing junior leaders. Companies, a lot of companies today, a lot of companies that I go talk, uh, talk with and give presentations. You know, one of the things I always ask when I go there, when I first get there, I go down and talk to the very lowest person I can find in the organization. I said, what's the leadership development? What's your chances of moving up in this organization? Are they having training for you? Do you go to a, a quarterly training or a yearly training or anything that gives you the ability, at least the ability to move up in the organization so that they're not always bringing new leaders in from outside? And that's okay. Sometimes you want some new blood every once in a while. I got that. But if you have a good leadership development program where you are developing your own leaders, I mean, you look at any pro sport team, the teams that are the best are the ones who develop their own talent. They don't go out and trade for it and they don't go on the free agent market. They, they develop their talent from young age and bring them up. So I think you, you got to do that because that gives them two things. It shows them that they have that ability to move up if they want to. And it again, it shows that you care about them. So again, you're just reinforcing that trust between you and them that you actually care and you want them to be the best they can be uh, in, in not only in your organization, but as a person. I just love it. And I'm still, and I can't believe it, hearing aspects of it's best to lead kind of with a, an element of fear in the employee um, because They'll do what they say. Now, I would think that in the army, you have the best ability to be able to justify that behavior and going, 
fear in that situation kind of makes sense. And if it's going to be <laughs> used to lead anywhere, I would think it would be there. What is your take on that? I, I think it's horrible. And <laughs> there are some leaders in the army who do that. And there's some leaders everywhere who do that as evident. I mean, you're, you asked the question. So obviously you heard of it in other places too, but, but I think it's horrible. Um, the, if if you develop the relationship with the people you lead and you're setting the example, people will follow you no matter what you ask them to do. And, and the army and the military is a perfect example of that. I mean, they'll charge a machine gun nest if you tell them to do it, if they trust you and, and you're leading them in that charge. I mean, again, you got to be out front. You, there's a reason it's called leader because <laughs> you're in front of them. You're You're leading them. You're not pushing them. You know, so I think that the key to that, to 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 keep from being being the fear. Now, that doesn't mean you don't hold them to standards. And if people don't meet standards, then you have to counsel them and you have to there has to be consequences for not meeting standards. But here's the difference. Here's the difference between a boss who leads by fear and a leader who leads by example. A boss, if if you're not meeting the standards, I walk up to you. Hey, Michelle, you're not meeting the standards. Fix it and walk away, or this is going to happen. And then you walk away. A leader says, Michelle, you're not meeting the standards. Here's the standard. This is what you're doing. We got to make up that gap. And then this is how we're going to do it. And you actually come up with a plan that says, okay, for the next month, six months, year, whatever you decide, you and the person you're counseling decide is the right time limit to, for that. Then you come up with a plan and you actually go through that plan to help retrain that person so that they can meet the standard. So there has to be standards and there has to be consequences if you don't meet the standard, but that, but that shouldn't be fear. And I don't consider that fear. That's doing your job and making them do their job. And if that, if that makes them fearful, then they need to go do something else, I guess. Yeah. I don't think running in front of a machine gun would be my first instinct, no matter who else had gone out around it. Like, oh, Jeff's over here. <laughs> <laughs> It's not for everybody. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I need that one from a young age, that's for sure. So <laughs> what would you say is your favorite part of your job now or your career? I, it, it's it's the times that I was in charge of people when I got it, got the privilege to lead people. Um, right. Tell me. But, but in that was probably the times I was deployed. Um, you know, I was deployed to the first Gulf War. I deployed Bosnia, the deployed to Kosovo. And the reason I say that, I mean, you hate being away from your family. You hate those, all that kind of stuff, yeah. but you actually got to do the job you were trained to do. You, you were out there leading people in the, in the environment that you've actually trained them. And if you did it right, then you know, they can do the job that you're asking them to do. And it becomes really fun to get out there and see you, your, the people you lead and the people you've trained actually execute the things that that you you trained them to do nice. are there any parallels that you can see in business for that of kind of when when people are kind of in the action so to speak oh, of absolutely. what they've been trained to do what would you equate that absolutely. to so, so when i when i was run, running the day-to-day -day operations of the food bank you know when we were out doing food handout you know doing a a an event where we were handing out food and we had some huge ones because when I, within a month of me taking over the day-to-day -day operation, the BP oil spill happened in the Gulf. Well, the, the food bank that I worked, that I ran the day-to-day -day operations had 52 counties along the Gulf coast from Mississippi to the panhandle of Florida. So all of those people were affected by that spill because they couldn't go you know, those people who fishing. had a living out in the Gulf, fishing, shrimping, canning, whatever, uh, fish, fish guides, you know, not, none of that could happen. So we had to feed them and had to keep them going until they could uh, get back out into the Gulf. So, I mean, we, we went through training, we went through planning, we went through all those things. And then to go out there and actually see one of those events where you're feeding four or 500 families. Wow actually happen and happen without a hitch and with everybody left with some food that made you feel really good. Nice. I love it. So when it comes to things like fear of doing the thing, whatever that might be and um, change, 
and those two may be integrated <laughs> or yep. not. Lots of times um, they are. How do you, as a leader, um, help people to maneuver through those? Yeah, so I think we'll, we'll hit change first. I think the okay. important part of change, because nobody likes change. Okay, <laughs> we're we're all creatures of habit. We all do things the same way all the time. And I always, when I talk to organizations, I always tell the guys, if you don't believe me, remember how you shaved this morning, because I promise you, you will shave exactly the same way tomorrow. Exactly. When you put your shoes on, most people put their shoes on the exact same way every single day. You don't even think about it. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. That allows you to think about things that are important, not about the simple things, but we're creatures of habit. We do things by habit and we don't like to change that. So first of all, you have to get them to buy into the change. And the way I always like to do that is if we're going to have to change something, if there's something that needs to, a decision that needs to be made on how we're going to change some way we're doing something, I like to bring the people in that are actually going to be doing the change, doing what's mm -hmm. going to have to change. And I, I say, look, we got, we have to change. There's no question about that. Give me some ideas of what you think of the, is the right way to do it, a better way to do it. And you'll be amazed at what happens. Somebody you think is your superstar will come up with a dumb answer. And somebody you think is the, the weakest link in your team every once in a while will come up with some fabulous answer. And just, you know, what I tell leaders is, look, you are under no obligation to use any of their ideas. Mm. But what generally happens, at least I've experienced, is I'll use a little bit of your ideas and a little bit of somebody else's ideas and throw in some of my ideas. And now we have a plan. The difference is it isn't Colonel McCullough's plan. It's our plan. We had a say in it. Now they got skin in the game. Now there's a reason to make it successful. And then the second part of that is you have to follow up because if you don't, they're going to go right back to doing things the exact same way they've always done it. Just If nothing else, just out of habit. So you have to follow up to make sure that the changes are, are happening. Fear is a different thing. I think fear is, is one of those things that you can, and, and we do it very well in the military, you train your mind. When you train, you train your mind to go through the process of whatever it is you're doing so that while you're doing that process, you can kind of drown out the fear. You, you never, nobody's fearless. I mean, we all have fears. But if you train well enough and you teach people well enough what, the, what they have to do, then they can overcome that fear. Because there's a great quote out there, and I can't remember who it was that said it, but it's courage is not the absence of fear. It's overcoming your fear and still doing what you have to do. And that's the key. You, you got to get people to understand that you're, they're gonna be, there's going to be times when they're afraid of change or whatever it is that you're doing. But you can work through it and you can still do what has to be done. Love that. So can you give us an example of one of your uh, Cinderella stories, of one of your clients that you've been working with? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so I, I think, you know, when, when I came here to Daytona and I started the recruiting job, um, I have four schools that I recruit for, for our Army ROTC program. So I'm trying to get students that are already on campus or coming to campus to join Army ROTC um, and become an Army officer eventually. Well, one of those schools had 15 cadets at it when I took over as the recruiting officer. And I, I, I sat down with a couple people on campus, the vice president for enrollment, the athletic director, uh, the president of the university, uh, provost, a couple other people. And I kind of said, okay, let's, let's brainstorm this and figure out how we can increase the size of this population on here. It's, it's good for you because nobody pays full price for the, a, a university except the United States government. And if I get them on a scholarship, we're going to pay you full price. Um, and it's good for us because, and it's good for you because you've got that population on campus is just another part of diversity on campus. I said, and it's good for us because we we need army officers and and we'd love to grow this pro part of the program. And so we came up with a few ideas that worked for them and worked for us. And right before the pandemic, it's gone back down a little bit since then, but right before the pandemic, which uh, 
So I took over in 2011, that was what, 2020. So in nine years, we went from 15 cadets to 106 cadets at that school. Nice, that's awesome, good for you. So when it comes to entrepreneurs and their stumbling blocks in their business, what kind of stumbling blocks might a listener be having right now? And they're going, oh my God, Oakland, I need your help so bad. What what kind of stumbling blocks? Yeah, what kind of problems, issues, pains are they experiencing in their business that kind of they're they're looking at you going, yep, I need you. Yeah, I, I can tell you every company <laughs> I go to and talk to is the number one thing yep. is communication. Yeah, people think they've communicated, but they haven't. You, this is not communication. Okay. <laughs> Sending a text is not communication. I'm sorry. It's not. It, I mean, it can be part of the communication, but it can't be the communication. And, and I was talking to somebody, I don't know, about a month and a half, two months ago, and ru runs his organization. And he said, I have implemented no text, no email Friday. So everybody in the, in the office, everybody inside that building cannot text or email anybody inside the building. Now, if you, gotta, if you gotta do some business outside of the building, got it. Call, email, he said call. He still didn't want him to email or text, he said call them. Um, but inside, if you had to talk to somebody, you had to get out of your seat and go find that person and talk to them face to face. There's a concept for you, right? Right. Um, so, and, and I, I love that part of it um, because if I'm telling you what I want you to do face to face, I know, I can tell by your facial expression, whether or not you really understand what it is that I, I'm asking you to do. Yeah. And even if I'm, I, I have a question, then, then, I, then I just ask the simple question. Okay, Michelle, tell me in your own words what I just told you to do. Now mm -hmm. I know whether or not you understood me or not. Because that's the biggest thing is communication is horrible in most mm -hmm. organizations. They think it's good, but it's not. Yeah. So I think that's the number one thing. I think the second thing, that I think companies uh, are not doing very well on in today's society is developing their culture. The, that is one of the number one jobs of a leader, the leader of that company, that organization, whatever it is, is to develop the culture that they want in that organization. And I always tell them, look, your vision and your plan, that's where, where you are today and where you wanna be, however far in the future, and how you're going to get there. Your culture is how you are along that road every single day. And you've got to get that right. I had a, a another businessman, local businessman here, and he's about 35, 30, 40 years old, started his business. It's starting to grow. And I was talking to him about building his culture. And I said, you know, it's going to take time and effort and money and training. And he said, no, nope, Colonel McCullough, you're wrong. I said, yeah, how? He said, I just got to hire the right people. I said, good luck with that young man. Good luck. Yeah. You're going to get a culture. It isn't going to be the one you want. <laughs> I know. Be the one, one you want, but it won't be a culture. That's awesome. Well, and I, I can go back to the flashback Fridays with no tech. Because I, I really think that there is something fantastic about having a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody that you don't get the energy that somebody has. You don't get kind of the disposition unless you're face to face with them. Absolutely. And and I think by doing that and forcing that, you start to realize, oh, when they said that, they were really calm when they said that. They didn't say it the way I hear exactly. it when I see them. <laughs> exactly, because like, yeah. it's really I, hard to express emotion in a text. Now, I guess with emojis, which I don't use, but I guess but, you might be able to do some of that. But, but it, it still isn't the same. Plus, the, here's the other part of that. Again, just like the leader has to learn about the people he, he or she is leading, the people on your team need to learn about pe the people on their team as well. Right. And the only way they're going to do that is a face-to-face, -face, get to know each other. And, and I think along with that no text, no email Friday, I think a, a smart company, a smart leader is going to have social events. Now, obviously, unlike in the Army where we have mandatory fun and you don't have a choice, most people, most people have a choice in this. So you got to really make it fun and you got to make it worth somebody's while of coming. Um, but I think that those are really good. And I, I see, you know, organizational days and those kinds of things in some companies. 
and they're very well attended and and you see the esprit de corps build and people get to know each other and 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 that only helps the organization right and i think it's especially important right now because because of the lockdown people didn't have the skill set to do things like how do you shake somebody's hand and when you're told you can't shake their hand now it's not just you know back in the 80s we had training on this is you know a fish handshake you don't do those you don't do the yeah. hammer handshake you don't do all these things and with three years of not shaking anybody's hands you don't really get the nuances and it, there's no real kind of safe place to practice that because it's not that it's disease not safe it's you look like an idiot not safe and nobody wants to look like an idiot right so i i think i think you're right i think that the lockdown that we went through was uh did nobody any favors um and especially businesses um and the the leader with their employees and you know i during that i had some businessmen who would say okay so, so how do i lead people that aren't at work and i said it's it's more difficult, absolutely. I said, but here's my suggestion to you. Uh, first of all, you got to have a few more meetings um, over Zoom, and you have to require that everybody is there and everybody has their camera on, so they actually see that they are not alone in this organization. They're not just at home doing their part. They're still a part of a greater organization, of, of something greater than them. And then when you can, on occasion, if, if you can, bring everybody together one day out of a month or whatever, at, at, you know, you might have to have safe distancing, whatever, but try to get people together once a, a month or once a quarter, whatever the area you're in allows you to do. Here in Florida, we didn't have that issue, but, nice. um, but some places I know did. Mm -hmm. So, but, but you got to make an effort. You can't just say, well, they're not at work, so I can't lead them. Uh, you know, I, 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 I was, I had the honor one time of listening to General Hal Moore uh, from the United States Army. I think he retired a three-star general, but he was the guy, if you've ever watched, we were soldiers once and young. He's the guy that Mel Gibson played as the Lieutenant Colonel. So it was the first big army battle, uh, American army battle in Vietnam. And he he was talking, and I had the privilege to be in the audience. And he said, he was talking just about this, about solving problems. And he said, look, life and leadership are not like baseball. It's not three strikes and you're out. If the first thing you try doesn't work, try another thing. If that doesn't work, try another thing. If that doesn't work, try another until you figure out what works. But you, But a leader doesn't just say, okay, nothing I can do there's always something you can try new and you got to, you just got to make that effort. Nice. I love it. So I know our listeners are going to want more from you. How did they start their journey with you? Yeah. So I have a website, uh, LTC And on there, it has my email address. It has my cell phone number. Happy to connect with whoever wants to connect with me. And we can set up a zoom if, if you want to do that. I'm, I've been on about six of them this today. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and then I'm on all the social media, but I really work on LinkedIn. And that's where you and I met um, is on LinkedIn. And and so if you go on LinkedIn, there aren't too many Oakland McCulloughs out there. I think you can find me. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to connect with you and start a conversation. And, you know, if it's just giving you some advice, I do that sometimes. Sometimes people call me, get, get uh, link up with me on LinkedIn to have me come speak at their conference, their training event, whatever. And I'm happy to do whatever there is that you need me to do. Nice. I love it. So let me ask you, knowing that you went into the army first and then the job, which again, I admire. And I think it takes a little bit of special kind of crazy, but at what <laughs> point in life did you know that you were a special kind of crazy enough to think that you could become an entrepreneur? That That's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> Because I never, never really, when I was young, business and all that never really interested me at all. And, you know, my father-in-law uh, used to tell me, you know, with all you, with your drive and your self-discipline and your, all the stuff you have, you, you, you could go run a business and make millions of dollars. And I was like, okay, not, doesn't interest me. Thanks. Um, but a, about, I don't know, about 10 years ago, when I was going around talking to people 
high school kids mainly, but some college students and 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 having a couple couple companies have me come talk to their people. And I saw how we're just not doing a good job of leading people and and teaching the younger generation what good leadership is. So at that point, I thought to myself, I came up with that presentation that I give and I've added to it and changed it over the years, but I've been doing it for about 10, 12 years now. And and I thought to myself, well, I want to write a book. And eventually I want to get out and be a, a public speaker uh, out on the speaking circuit so I can reach as many people as I can with my message. And because that really is at this point in my life, probably about three or four years ago, it became my passion to get out and talk to as many people as I could and spread my message. Not because, not to make me famous. I don't, it, your legacy isn't about you, unlike most people think. Your legacy is about what you leave behind. It's about the young men and women that you touch that then will touch young men and women when they're leaders and on down the line so that long after you're gone, somebody still knows how to lead and is teaching the next generation. Nice. I love it. So you've been absolutely awesome. Any last words for our peeps? Oh, I thanks for having me on the show. And again, if, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, I'd love to come talk at one of your events, but even if it's just to, to get to know each other, I, again, I'm a, I'm kind of a people person. So I, I don't mind hopping on a zoom just if, to hear your story and you hear my story. And if it doesn't lead anywhere business-wise, that's okay with me. I just like to meet new people. I love it. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And I know how valuable it is. Thanks, Michelle. I appreciate it. Thanks. Peeps, this is Michelle Nedelec. Thank you for being with us here today. Be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your friends. We love helping entrepreneurs grow. Thank you for listening to our show. I'm all about being a resource center for entrepreneurs to give them the information and the support that they need to make it in business. As such, the notes for this show can be found at our website at awarenessstrategies.com slash blog. Be sure to subscribe, give us a rating, I like five stars personally, and share with your friends.